Years ago, I remember prepping for an especially big trip home to see my parents. And it was an international trip. And at the time, I was traveling alone with four of our kids. Jonathan was eight, William was two, Laika was four, and Amy, well, Jonathan was eight months. Eight months, two years, four, and six, so they're all little. And so traveling alone internationally with four little kids is no small feat. And, so, and nobody really helps you. They basically see that crowd of people going and everybody just hopes they don't have to sit near them. And so I knew that I would have to be self-sufficient. I would have to have a game plan that would allow me to get from A to B without needing to rely on anyone's help. So this was the deal. I had a double stroller and I put William in the front and Jonathan in the back. Now, Jonathan was the smaller one, and normally he would go in front, but we were going through a phase where William's favorite thing to do was like to rip out all of Jonathan's hair from behind, so I thought, oh, I'm on to that. I'm gonna switch them around. So William can't reach Jonathan, and then I had one car seat that was balanced on the top of the stroller, and another car seat that was hooked on this arm, and then I was just kind of guiding it with my hip. And Leica was wearing a little backpack, that, an ingenious invention, because it was attached like with a little belt, and I could hook it to my belt loop here so he could only go so far. And Amy, well, Amy was just on her own. She just had to like keep up, keep an eye out for us, and for the most part, she did this. So the logistics of these trips were a really big deal. So the night before we were leaving, I was in the bits of packing and just trying to put everything together, a little frazzled, because these trips always seemed quite daunting to me. And Leica came in and was complaining about an earache. And I started thinking, oh, you know, maybe I can just take a risk, give him a little Motrin, and hopefully he'll be okay on the flight. And then I started thinking about myself alone with all four of the kids, and it was a flight with a, a connection, and, and, and just the logistics of it all, I thought, no, you know what, I better take him in, I better get him into the doctor and see what they can do if they can give him an antibiotic. Well, I couldn't get in with the doctor, and so we ended up at the ER, and Leo met me there, which was great, and, and but we were both like, I'm sure it's just gonna be really quick antibiotic and on we'll go. Well, that was not to be the case because when the doctor examined Leica, he said, you know, actually we need right now to get tubes in his ears. I'm like, you've gotta be kidding me, like right now? Putting him under? Like this can't be that urgent. He's like, no, really, he needs tubes. He needs his adenoids out and he needs tubes put in. We need to do it tonight and I've got one, one slot left, let's go. Well, I immediately got really unglued because none of my kids had ever had surgery. And I'm like, general anesthetic? You know, I'm like, this is crazy. We're taking a trip tomorrow. And he goes, you know what? If we do this tonight, he's really going to be fine. You're going to be able to fly tomorrow. I'm like, are you kidding? He goes, no, no, I think you will. But, but I was all worked up. I was all nervous. I had, I guess, maybe 15, 20 too many questions for the doctor. And as I was getting more and more like nervous and worked up, I started to notice his body language changing. And actually, his whole body kind of shifting over to Leo. And he started directing all his comments in one direction, right? And it's like, crazy woman over here. Like, can I talk to you about the fact, like, we've got a couple minutes here. We've got to get the show on the road if we're going to do this. And so Leo being the more rational one of the two of us, you know, it's like, okay, yes, it'll all be fine. Well, so we finally decide, okay, yes, he's going to go in for the surgery. I'm going to trust the doctor that it's going to be fine and he's going to come out the other end. Um, but as I started then asking again, maybe one, maybe three, maybe however many, too many questions about the general anesthetic. The doctor interrupted me and said, here's the deal, we, we really have got to get going. And one parent is going to be allowed to come in to the operating room. It's all going to be fine. So I'm, of course, immediately thinking, oh, okay, well, that's good. Because then if I've got questions, I can even, you know, I'm just going to be right, <laughs> right there. I'm like, oh, oh, good. Okay, well, I'm, I'm all set to go. You know what, do you need me to do? And he's like, huh. And he looks over at Leo and he's like, I would like you to put scrubs on, and I would like you to come into the room with me. And I remember just being so beside myself, so angry, like, why would you not pick the mother? Why would you pick the rational, calm father over the hysterical but very loving mother? So I was ushered out into the hallway, and Leo went in and, and put his scrubs on. And as I sat there, I got more and more nervous and worked up. And my fear was that Leica was not going to wake up from the surgery, that this was, this was going to just you know, be the end of it all, which of course now just seems ridiculous. Then it really did not seem ridiculous to me. And so I started to cry because I was this big combination of emotion and mad and you know, women's rights and why did the man get to go and whatever all else was going on. And, um, and I just never will forget the feeling when this nurse stepped out and she handed me just this little pile and it was neatly folded, Leica's little clothes with his little pair of underwear on the top. And like that was, that was me, that was like me ended right there. And I looked up at her and I looked behind her and there's this big sign and it said, no access. And I hated that feeling, that feeling that that was desperately where I wanted to go. That was where I wanted to be, but I was clearly not welcome. 
and not allowed. That feeling of no access was something that the Israelites were very familiar with, the Israelites of the Old Testament. It was woven into the very fabric of their worship of God into the very architecture of the temple where they went to worship. It made it very clear just the way the temple was built that not just anybody was able to walk in and commune with God. And when we read about the longing for God in Psalm 42, as the deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I enter and see the face of God? Before Christ came, the answer was, you can't. You can't enter. You can't come close. You can't draw near. You can't see the face of God. God had instructed the Israelites just exactly how they were to worship him. It was, it was a prescription, and it was laid out very, very clearly. And if they wanted to connect with God, then they could not just stroll up with Starbucks in hand and ripped jeans. Like, that was not how this went. There was something very, very formal about the old way to approach God. So I want to take a look at a slide of the Old Testament temple. And what we see here, love the pointer, out here we have the Gentiles' courtyard. That was the area where anybody was able to go. Whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, you were welcome to be out here. But if you wanted to enter into this area of the temple, the women's courtyard, the Gentiles had to stay out. And that means probably the bulk of us in this room would have been able to stop right here at the Gate Beautiful, and that would have been as close as we would have gotten. So as women, we could have come through here. We could have come a little bit closer. See the chamber of wood over here, which was used to fire up the altars, the chamber of lepers, where they went for cleansing. And then you come to this great gate, and if you wanted to go through this door here, well, you know what? Very, very few women, very few people in this room would have been able to go in, because that was for men only. Okay, so all of the females of the bench here, we would have stopped right about there, and this is where we would be able to hang out. Men would be able to come in here, so Israelite men, this is where they could be. Priests were allowed to enter here, and then back in here in the Holy of Holies, that's where the high priest was allowed to go. So in this area outside, what we find here are the slaughter tables. Now this is when you would walk in, and this is where you would bring your animal, and where the animals would be sacrificed, asking for forgiveness for God. And after the animals were sacrificed, the priests could go over here to the laver, and this is where they would wash their hands after the sacrifices before they would go in to worship in the holy place. So if I can switch to the next slide. Okay, so as they came inside, this is what we would find. So this is the holy place over here. This is where the priests would minister day after day. And in this room, what we would find would be the altar of incense. This is where, prayer, where incense was always bringing, where prayers were to be going. There was like a symbol of prayers going up to God. We had the golden lampstands, the menorahs. And this was to remind the people of God's perpetual presence with them. And then we had the table of showbread. And the table of showbread was something where 12 loaves of unleavened bread were baked, and they were set out, and they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the 12 tribes of Israel, what happened with that? So it was out there representing them. But what's really interesting is the literal translation of the showbread is bread of the face. I think that's really interesting because the Talmud, which is a compilation of oral Jewish tradition which was put in writing between AD 200 and 600, describes a tradition that took place three times a year. And so three times a year, the priests removed the showbread and they brought it outside and they lifted it up. And do you know what they said to the people? Behold God's love for you. They held the bread of the face and said, behold God's love for you. So after you came out of the holy place, you could move into the holy of holies, but only if you were the high priest. And then only once a year. And as the high priest, you were invited to come through once a year for one purpose and one purpose alone. You came in with blood, blood of a sacrificed animal, to put it on the Ark of the Covenant and to ask forgiveness for the sins of the people. The Ark of the Covenant held a bowl of manna, 
the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod. We have the two cherubim guarding the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant itself had a, a cover, which was called the mercy seat, which was totally gold and absolutely beautiful. So the way in which a priest could approach God then, it was with blood, it was entering, and he spread the blood on the mercy seat. And this was an absolutely sacred, sacred place. And what I really want you to pay attention to here is right in the middle is the veil. The veil was an incredibly imposing wall. It was a fabric wall, but it was so thick. It was six inches thick. It was so large, they say it was six stories high, 60 feet high, 20 feet wide. It took 300 priests to hoist it up and to get it in position. It was imposing, and it delivered a strong, strong message. This place is holy. You may not enter here. So why was this place so protected? It was so protected because this is where God dwelt. This is where he came down in the, in the cloud and dwelt among his people. And so it was an incredibly precious place where the priest was only allowed to enter that one day, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which remains the highest and most holy day in the Jewish calendar. So on this day, what he would do, that work that he would do, is described in Hebrews 9. The priests, in performing their services, would go into the outer tabernacle, right here, repeatedly. But the high priest alone could go into the inner one once a year, and not without blood that he offers for himself and from the sins of the people. So after the priest would have done this and would have made atonement for the sins of the people, and that word atonement is really important. Atonement can also be translated as satisfaction. So God would see that and would be satisfied. So he would make atonement for the sins of the people, first with the blood of a bull, and then with the blood of a goat. And then he would prepare for something called the scapegoat ceremony. And what, would he, what the priest would do then is he would place his hands on a goat's head and he would confess the sins of the Israelites over the goat as if they were then being translated to the goat. And then the goat would then be sent out into the desert carrying the Israelites' sins with it. And theologian Mary Healy has a really interesting commentary, describes an interesting occurrence recorded in the Talmud. And I read, according to the Talmud, the priest had a custom of tying a scarlet cord to the scapegoat. And every year, the cord was reported to have turned white as the goat was led away from the city. A miraculous sign that God had accepted the sacrifice. But the Talmud records that for the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the cord failed to change color, causing great consternation. Moreover, during that same period, inexplicably, the western light of the menorah kept going out, and the doors of the temple kept opening of their own accord. The rabbis later interpreted these ominous phenomena as presaging the imminent destruction of the temple. But amazingly, they began to occur just at the time when Christ, the all-holy victim, offered the once-for-all sacrifice for sin. There was no longer a need for a scapegoat. So God had given Moses very specific instructions about how things were to be constructed, the way in which God wanted to be approached in worship. And when the time came for him to construct the tabernacle in the wilderness, he followed every single instruction, every dot, every T was crossed, every I was dotted. And then when Solomon later built the temple, he did the same. It was recreated in exactly the way that it had been required to be made by God. The Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies in the temple exactly as it had been in the tabernacle in the wilderness. So why? Why was God so incredibly specific about exactly how he wanted things to be made? Well, the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. In speaking of the Israelites' worship of God in the tabernacle, we read, 
they worship in a copy and in a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. As Moses was warned when he was about to erect the temple, the tabernacle, for he says, See that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. You see, there is a sanctuary in heaven with a heavenly tabernacle, ark, and mercy seat. And what was a copy on earth was a reality in heaven. Now, while the temple provided a means for the people to be forgiven for their sins, it also delivered a strong and a steady message. You are not holy. God is. And you may not draw near. Keeping this reality in mind, fast forward to Jesus hanging on the cross. To Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. And in that passage, we read that at the end of his earthly life, Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, that veil, the veil of the sanctuary, tore into from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks split. God tore the veil right down the middle. And this is not something that's something truly that would have been impossible for a man to have done. Remember, it was six inches thick, 60 feet high, 20 feet long. It was said that even horses who were tethered to the four corners of the veil, if they all ran in opposite directions, could not tear it apart. Can you imagine the chaos that resulted from that gaping Whole. This, this area where nobody had dared even come close, suddenly open and all could see in. That torn veil symbolized a monumental change in the way the people were going to be approaching God, in the way that God was to relate to man. Everything had changed. Now, what did the high priest have to carry when he went into the Holy of Holies year after year on Yom Kippur, he had to enter with blood year after year, and no one else was allowed in. But now, as it says in Hebrews 10, verse 19, through the blood of Jesus, we have confidence of entrance into the sanctuary by a new and living way he opened for us through the veil. The priests in the temple had to offer those sacrifices for atonement day after day, over and over again. Day after day, innocent animals were killed as sins were transferred to them and they were slaughtered on the altars. But these sacrifices never dealt permanently with the problem of sin. As it says in Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, and this is a paraphrase, the old plan was only a hint of the good things in the new plan. Since that old plan wasn't complete in itself, it couldn't complete those who followed it. No matter how many sacrifices were offered year after year, they never added up to a complete solution. If they had, the worshipers would have gone merrily on their way, no longer dragged down by their sins. But instead of removing awareness of sin, when those animal sacrifices were repeated over and over again, they actually heightened awareness and guilt. The plain fact is, the blood of bull and of goats cannot get rid of sin. And according to Hebrews 9, chapter 9, the animal sacrifices also could not purify the conscience. They couldn't do anything about that inner tribunal where we condemn ourselves, where we drown in guilt. That self-reproach then and now robs us of our ability to experience rest and experience peace. The animal sacrifices in the temple simply were not enough. That final substitution for sin, that final atonement, had to take place in the heavenly tabernacle. What was happening on earth was a copy. It was a shadow. 
an innocent substitute, a perfect atonement, a bloody sacrifice would need to be made in the heavenly tabernacle in order for sin to be permanently dealt with. And here, our postmodern culture has had enough. Enough talk about blood. Enough talk about sacrifice. Enough talk about sin, guilt. Guilt? Because if truth is relative, then you don't need to feel guilty. Nobody can make you feel guilty unless you let them. You decide. And yet, we cannot get rid of our shame. We can't get rid of the underlying sense that we are not okay. That we are not enough. So we hustle for our worth and we never seem to quite shake that feeling of inadequacy. Deep down, we know. And that guilt that our world is so bent on eradicating is actually a real gift. It's one of God's greatest gifts to us because it's a reminder. It's evidence of the fact that there is something bigger, greater outside of ourselves. It reminds us that we are not the final word and it links us to someone who holds the meaning of life in his hands. We need a solution to our problem with guilt and shame. We need a solution that gives us life. And what we've just read tonight is that life is in the blood. Ernest Gordon wrote a book called The Valley of the Quay. He was a POW in Thailand. And in this book, he writes of a day when the prisoners were all out and they had been working away and working hard and it had come to the end of the day when all of the tools were collected and were counted. But there was a problem. There was a shovel missing. And that was a big deal. Because if someone had stolen a shovel, you could use the shovel to escape. You could use the shovel to harm someone. And so the guard became completely unglued and just started screaming at the prisoners, where is the shovel? Who took the shovel? Someone took the shovel, lined them all up. And he said, one of you here has taken the shovel. Who took the shovel? And he's just like crazy man, totally coming unglued. And, and the men were all lined up, heads down, saying nothing. And furious, he pulled out his gun, he cocked it, put it up on his shoulder, and he said that I am going to go through this line and I'm going to shoot each one of you one by one by one by one until someone confesses. And out stepped a man from the regiment of Argyle. And he saluted and he said, I took the shovel. And the guard came over with all the fury in him and began to pummel the man and beat that man with all that he had, fist pounding, just taking everything out of him. And still the man stood stood still saluting, stood calm, stood unmoving as blood streamed down his face. And it was as if the calm just drove the guard to even greater fury. And so he picked up his gun and he took it and he brought the butt of the gun down on the top of the man's head, cracked a skull, and the man crumbled to the ground, lifeless, dead, never to rise again. And his fellow prisoners went over and picked up his body and carried it back to the camp. And they counted the shovels again. They'd miscounted. There was no shovel missing. That group of prisoners had been saved by the blood of an innocent man. Can you feel the weight of the power of that sacrifice? Of course you do. And do you not think that each one of those men lived a different life because they had witnessed that that day? Because an innocent man had stood in their place and had bled for them on their behalf. What if that blood had been shed for you? Would you live differently? 
You know, God has always known that we are incapable of dealing with the problem of, of sin and of our guilt and of our shame on our own. And all throughout the Old Testament, he was teaching his people that forgiveness was going to always involve suffering. It was going to always involve sacrifice. We read in Hebrews 9, verses 23 through 24, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified by these rites, by the sprinkling of blood. But the heavenly sacrifices by better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one but into heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. It was Jesus' blood that was spread on the mercy seat in heaven. Hebrews 9.12 says, He entered once for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining for us eternal Redemption. Jesus entered the, sac the sac sanctuary with his own blood and appeared before God on our behalf. And unlike the Greek gods who would demand that innocent people be sacrificed for their pleasure, God offered himself. Remember who Jesus is. He is our creator. He is the exact representation of God. He is divine. He didn't say sacrifice that person over there to appease me. He stepped out and he paid the price himself and he absorbed into himself all the fury, all the evil, all the sin and the suffering on our behalf. And Jesus appeared before the Father as the ultimate atonement. Remember, atonement, that is the process of making amends for our sins. It's a way of compensating for wrong. And another word for it is satisfaction. And so when God the Father looked upon the blood of his Son, he was satisfied. He was satisfied with that sacrifice and offers forgiveness for anyone who is covered by the blood of his son. So I ask you, do you want access to the Father? Do you want to draw near and come into his presence in the Holy of Holies? Do you long to be ushered into his heart? Then you need to enter with blood but it's not the blood of animals. You enter with the blood of Jesus. As it says in Romans 5, verses 8 and 9, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since now we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have gained access to this grace in which we now stand. We have gained access. What was once off limits, out of reach to us, a place that said, you are not holy, you are not good enough, you may not come close to me, now says, draw near. And when that veil was torn, it was sending a message to all that there is a new way to gain access to God. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, we read, but to those who did accept him, he gave the power to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And what do children get? Children get access to their father. 
and our Heavenly Father's children do not get shut out by a thick curtain. They are told to draw near, to come close. Jesus invites this world and each and every heart within it to draw close, and he sees the brokenness of our world, the way in which our world is literally moaning with pain. Much of it is hidden, hidden in hearts, right here in this room. But God hears every cry. He sees each and every unspoken ache and grief. Our God who tore the curtain and gave his son so that he could be close to you, he goes to the depths. He goes to those places inside you that you do not allow anyone else to go. It's a place only he can go. But he goes there with a healing balm. He knows you intimately. He sees your hidden pain, and he weeps with you. But he also looks into your eyes, and he says, you are going to be okay. He sees the depth of your loneliness. He sees your unsettledness, your unrootedness, your sorrow, your disappointment, your fear. He sees it all, but he is not unhinged by it. It's been said that a child can survive all sorts of difficulty, cruel peers, an unfair teacher, all sorts of hard. As long as when he comes home, his mama's face says, you are really okay. Author Glennon Doyle Melton puts it this way, That's all they're asking, isn't it? Mama, am I okay? And in the end, a child will call the rest of the world liars and believe his mama. So look to the face of God and hear him whisper, you are going to be okay. I am holding you. Do you feel unrooted? and unsettled. I am your anchor. Do you feel lonely? I am with you always. Are you disappointed or grieving? I am your hope. Are you afraid? I am your strength. You are going to be okay. The kingdom of heaven and closeness to the Father is given to his children. You are family. The veil is torn. You are invited to draw near. You are invited in. You belong. Doesn't matter where you've been. The Father's arms are open wide. As it says in Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near through the blood of Jesus. Pope Benedict describes it this way. Before Jesus, before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. This encounter with him as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniably painful transformation as through fire. But it is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. Run into the fire of his love. Open up your heart to him. You don't have to search anymore. You don't have to wander. You are family. You've been invited to come out of hiding and to please come home.
Will you pray with me, please? Lord God, may our hearts draw near, sprinkled clean with the blood of your precious Son, knowing that as you look at us, because we are covered by the blood of the Son, you say, she is good, I am satisfied. You are a new creation, he says. The old is gone, the new has come. As far as east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. He invites us to draw near, and may we do that right now with our hearts open and in asking for his healing balm to go deep within us. Amen.